Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 402 of the podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today on the show, we have a tribute to Bill Daly, who recently passed away. He was a noted artist and educator that worked in the Philadelphia area for over 70 years. He's received numerous awards of distinction from the College Art Association, American Craft Council, the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, and many other institutions. In this interview, we talk about his triumvirate of creativity and what it was like to look forward in your career at 90, or almost 90, as he talks about in this interview. We recorded this back in 2015, so I'd like to thank his son Tom for helping to arrange this interview. Also, I wanted to thank Charlotte Lindley Martin, who helped to get this interview together as well. If you'd like to see examples of his work, you can go to williamdaily.net. I send condolences out to his family as well as the many students he had over the year and the folks that loved him. He will definitely be missed. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. My middle name is Patrick. Most people call me Bill, and I live in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, and uh, I've lived there for almost 50 years. My studio is in the cellar, and uh, my wife is in the kitchen and upstairs, (laughs) and we have three kids. Uh, I told them stories at night and went back down and worked in the cellar, and Kate came down and gave me crits and told me whether she liked it or not. And her motto is that she's seldom right, but never wrong. (laughs) But when she's never wrong, but I'm confused or don't know what I'm doing, I never listen to what she tells me until I know that it's wrong. So there have been times when she said I should destroy that pot, and I ended up cutting it in half and making two pots. I made a new top for the bottom and a new bottom for the top and had two pots that were killers. But I had no idea that they were as bad as Kate thought. (laughs) Having your studio in your home gives you the ability to live around your work? Oh, it was marvelous. I could live around my children. I lived in a little teeny flat house which we in Feasterville, Pennsylvania. I taught at the Philadelphia College of Art. At that time, it was known as the Philadelphia Museum School of Art. And before that, it was the Philadelphia School of Industrial Arts. So it was a place that was peopled by fantastic makers, not intellectual savants who had lots of theory and bad hands. So I... I learned how to teach or became a teacher, watching these people be master makers. And, and that was in the industrial arts school? No, it was the Philadelphia Museum. School, Museum School of Art. Then it became the Philadelphia College of Art. I was more suited to that because I was a rare bird. I had a master's degree, which in the beginning it meant I was some kind of a strange freak that they needed to watch very carefully. <laughs> but I went through that. And uh, they became my fast friends. And I've, the three most important ones are in the book. I've written tributes to them. So my, my learning to be a maker was while I was becoming learning how to be a teacher of makers. So they've always been side by side. It was always together. <laughs> and being, doing it in my cellar taught me how to be with my family and be a maker. Because all my kids ended up being artists, which is sort of unfortunate. And, uh, but, but at the same time, uh, their, their kids were always coming for clay. They had their friends coming for clay. 
they made things and I fired them and so on. But my life then has always been, I'm in the cellar, the kids are going to bed, I go up and tell them a story, but I usually would fall asleep because I always had to do at least two things at once. One was teach and one was to make stuff. And the other one was to keep the family from stopping from leaving me or turning into delinquents. <laughs> so Charles Sanders Peirce calls this a trichotomy. And uh, religious people call this a trinity. So threeness is a magic amount of things to be confused about <laughs> at the same time. And I've managed to do that for, if I, I'm really only 89 now, but I'm telling everybody I'm 90 because it sounds better. <laughs> but I, I love the idea that when I get to be 90, I'll be a living trichotomy. Mm. Three 30-year sex segments. Well, let's, let's talk about the first 30 years for just a little bit. Okay, we'll, we'll um, do a trichotomy in this talk. That sounds great. Oh, that's good. So you, you, were a, you had, were a military person, and you were in the Army? Well, let's, you want to take the first 30 years from the beginning? Sure. My father was a house painter. He wanted to be, uh, he was very bright. He had to leave school. His father died of consumption working in a factory. He had to leave school in the ninth grade. I still have a letter from his principal of this free school in this little town begging my grandmother to let William stay in school because he was so talented and that he'd have a great career and so on. But my father didn't. He went into, he was apprenticed to a German painter and he became a main, master painter. He could paint sash with two hands. No, you know, he was near genius, and he had a mimetic memory. If he read a poem once, he could say it forever. He drove me crazy. I hoped that he would become mute because he would say, now, William, listen to this. And so he talked a lot. He was oh, a talker. He was much worse than I am. <laughs> and and uh, he loved language. And he loved poetry, and he loved reading, and he had this mimetic memory. I have still almost a complete vacuum. And so that's the core. And when I was a little kid with my sister Alice, who's also an artist, he would come home one night a week. We would have beets and spinach as the two vegetables. And my mother would keep the juices. The beet was a nice red. And the green was a kind of pukey green was the spinach. And she saved all the paper bags and opened them during the week and ironed them. And when we had spinach and beet juice night, we had art. So she'd put them all on the kitchen table, which is the only table we had. And that's where we ate at. It was white enamel. And Alice and I had brushes that my father swiped out of the factory about an inch. And we made killer paintings. We made Jackson Pollock look like cream of wheat. <laughs> and then my mother would put a line across the kitchen and hang them all up. And when my father came home, do you know the book called The Gift? Mm -hmm. Well, we found out about The Gift at maybe four or three because my father would come home and he had an Irish brogue a little bit because he, he was fourth generation in this country. But he had a brogue because we lived in an Irish enclave, and you, it was unfashionable not to have one. So, so he developed one. Uh, so, no, he, he, he had it naturally. But he would say, William, Alice, you have the gift. These things are fantastic. Look at these curves. Look at those colors blending and going together. And he, so uh, obviously we believed him. So, so being an artist was the first conscious thing that I was tuned in on way before I went to school. I went to parochial school, and they said, Mrs. Daly, William is different. And they advised me not to go there, and it was the best thing, because then I left, because when the kids would have a test in arithmetic, I'd look up at the board, and they had letters all along, yellow letters on black. Do you remember those? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I would make them a big Q, maybe, or a gorgeous S, 
And that would be my answer for the arithmetic. So I was zoned out. And it, do, do you think it was because you were daydreaming or because of dyslexia? No, it was because that's what I liked. Okay. That's what I wanted. Art was what you were interested in. And the in, sisters were very nice to me. They didn't beat me or anything, but they, they realized that uh, whatever was going to happen was not that. When was your first art training? First grade. And making paper dolls at home with my sister. I made the figures. She made the costumes. We cut them out together. She made a man and a woman. We played paper dolls. My mother taught us how to make pen wipers, where you put a chain stitch around the edge of a piece of felt. And you made a little one, a little one, a little one. You made a button, you sewed it together, and you made a present for somebody. So we were always doing these hand things and picture things. I carried the groceries. I know I'm going into this too much, but I think it's really the beginning. I I used to carry the groceries with my mother and my Nick, my friend Nikki. My 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 mother took in welfare kids, so we had a big family that changed. Some of them stayed, some of them left. Nikki stayed until he went in the navy, and I went in the air corps. So we carried these big bundles of groceries on the trolley car, walked a mile to the trolley car, went into the Yonkers, the next town, bought these two loaded things. So we had four buckets full, four big bags. We carried them back home, and for that we got a coloring book, which we always, mostly always had totally colored by Sunday night when we heard Jack Benny. And when we did this, we we soon got bored with coloring them so that they looked like you're supposed to. So we started doing really fantastic things with them, like changing the colors of all the people way before Chagall thought about it, or I even knew that one did that. We made plaids and polka dots, and we colored outside and left the inside open and so on. So when I got... When I was in high school and grade school, I became Billy the Boy Artist. I used to do old English lettering and do the honor rolls, but I never was on the honor roll. <laughs> but when I didn't like who was on the honor roll that was either rich or too smart to suit me, I would misspell his name. And it was a polygonic community of mill workers and Irish German foremen and the men who ran the factory and the people who commuted to New York who were lawyers and doctors and so on. And they, they made a great school system because they cared. And this was right outside of Yonkers, you said? That's right. Just uh, Hastings on Hudson, New York. So, so you, the, the art program was fantastic. You know, in, the, by the, in junior high school, I did all the senior high school, like Representation 1, Representation 2. It was descriptive drawing, really, on a very primal level. I later taught it in art school to industrial design students, but it started then. So by the time I got to be a senior, I, I did airbrush work, I did weaving, I did uh, sculpture, I did wood carving, I made an Afro head out of mahogany, and so on and so on. So I was a very special art student. When we did these big murals in sixth grade, all the other rich kids were making bricks, but they were very smart. I was doing the pharaoh's hands and his headdress, so I thought I was very smart. So I leaned on this all the time with the crutch of being able to make people laugh because I was harmless. So when I got to art school, I already, I'd been through the war. I'd been a prisoner. I already knew many, many of the things that the freshmen faced in the program I had done. And I'd been drawing since I was a little kid. I could copy Popeye, Joe Palooka, The Seven Dwarfs. Prince Valiant was my specialty with shading. Miss Travis gave me a wall as big as the wall behind you and gave me big sheets of paper and a box of Mongol pencils. Do you know what they are? Mm -hmm. They're water-soluble colored pencils that were very expensive in, in the 30s and the 40s. 
and she gave me a whole box to take home and gave me paper and she gave me the National Geographic mu magazine and she said, William, if you see any people in here that have no clothes on, because I used to look for it in the barber shop, she said, don't look at them. <laughs> <laughs> and of course I did immediately, but <laughs> after that, I would draw half of that book. But then I got so bored by that that I started taking something from page eight and combining it with the background in Africa or something and make, so I had a one man show all during my sixth grade. All, I, all I'm saying, I had a level of precocity and passion and obsession coupled with massive skillful stupidity. And that, do, you, do you think that, that human beings are inherently creative? Or yes, do you think that no, you were I, extra creative? No. I think if we had real education instead of mimic learning by on demand and we nurtured, and I did this as a teacher, and I, I shouldn't be boasting at something like this, but I was an extraordinary teacher mostly because I understood the students and because of my horrific experiences of many, which I'm not going to mention, but I had empathic peripheral insight. And I knew that if they all had different gifts, but if I can tune in on them and get them tuned in on it, I just had to watch them and nurture that and be demanding when they didn't meet their own specifications of what it meant to be extraordinary and to create atmospheres by which they were called to be take risks, to be venturesome, to be willing to fail numerous times before they knew what they thought they didn't know they knew that they didn't, and then make and turn it in and we'd have a crit. And everybody talked and we talked. I gave problems like, make me laugh as long as it's visual. I don't want you to do a charade because then you'll have to go into theater. And if we laughed, if I laughed and nobody else did, it was on me to tell me why I was laughing. What in the work quickened my sense enough to automatically laugh? If you had to laugh, if I said, yeah, if somebody was laughing because their friend made it, and it was one of those, ha, 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 I knew he was just being friendly to his friend. I'd say that's the most constipated laugh I've heard in <laughs> years. So anyway, but I did things like surprise me and so on and so on. And then I would give problems like, Show me in a series of six steps how to tie your shoes visually. So it wasn't just jumping off into the water. I used to tell the kids, you know, being a good artist is like being a high diver, and you dive into the pool, and it's empty, but you're urinating in it while you're going <laughs> down, and it's filled, and you dive into your own urine. So you're making it up as you go is what you're saying. That's right. It's urine. Yours. I have little Abner talk, urine. <laughs> so, so what I'm saying is that art, I'm a great devotee of John Dewey. I've read Art's Experience that I almost memorized it. I, and if you said repeat some of it, I can't. I don't have a memetic memory. But I know it. And I practiced it, and it fed me ways to teach so that it was just exciting as could be to teach. Because every time I got up to find out what we had, I was as naked as a jaybird, just like the students that were putting it up on the wall. It was not something that was pre-digested by me that someone else had to learn how to do. So there were some things about practice that if they didn't say what they hoped they were saying, I would always talk about that first. I said, this is loaded. The ideas are loaded. Your approach is loaded. And I'd say, why this and this and this and this? But if you really want to say something that thinks it's a cobweb and you're making marks that look like a hemp rope, it's never going to get to be a cobweb. So, and they'd say, yeah, I need to do that more, don't I? And then we had cobweb art. 
Then I'd say, that's enough, cobweb. No more cobwebs. <laughs> Well, anyway, I'm, so I, as a teacher, you felt like you needed to create an environment that was supportive, but also that you would criticize the objects they were making and not them. I the felt person. I was becoming a better artist while they were becoming a better artist, that we were all artists at different stages of our awareness and our, our gained skills that we learned, not that we were taught. So I was creating an environment that was our environment not my environment, for them to have an environment. So they would take ownership of that experience. We, we were in it all together. And when the end of the year come and we had our exhibit, you know, I mean it. And I have students still that I get letters from. There would be things there that the school hadn't caught on to for 10 years after these kids just intuited it at the beginning. Now, I know all academicians who get to be very specialized about it less and less with more and more of less and less disagree with me always. But I have the proof. I'm living it. I'm 90 years old, and I'm still making hot pots. So let's talk about the, the body of work that you're doing now. Because at 90, are your interests different in what you're trying to achieve with clay sure. than what they were then? I, my belief, and you'll see that when you listen to Mud Architect and so on, that, that my blathering, which I'm doing now, I, if I do things to the point where I know all about it, I call that was time. It's time to have is time. Is time is what was was about and might be in becoming. Making art is about possibility becoming. But you can't become out of something that you think, oh, I'm going to have a new project. I'm going to switch to working with macaroni and I'm going to color it blue and I'm going to hang it up and uh, take photographs of it and project them in blue light and uh, project them on a naked lady's chest and have a show. That's a project. Projects only come from past practice. So past practice means that everything you make is something you learned. And I'm very curious. I've read about everything. I know about all the different colors, cultures. I know how they made geometries. I know a lot about geometry. So I'm not just saying practice is mindless hands telling your mind what it knew and your mind telling what your hands should forget that you feed all this together and you keep growing out of where you were into something that's becoming. So my pots all hang together. I think you'll see that in the book, that they're not the same. If you're really smart, you can see where I shifted and where I got the hots for this. Even if it's something like I've make, been making pots, I made pots for 20 years that were all sitting on the ground, which is not, was pretty simple-minded, but when I thought, when I went around the pot this way, rotationally, like your mother's a rolling pin. Then I thought, well, why don't I go up and down? And then I thought, why don't I go inside and outside? Why is it inside and outside anyway? It's not. It's just a membrane. So when it was a membrane, it was a permeal membrane. Now, I can say that very clearly now because I lived through it. But what pots were when I was making them is your hands told you about the inside, your hand, other hand told you about the inside, outside, and it turned into a teapot that somebody showed you how to pull a handle, and then you learned how to make a spout. But I kind of wasn't good at that anyway, and just like in first grade when the sisters said, no, you're different, when I didn't some, did something badly, like I hated glazing, I did it. I taught glaze calculation because I had to, and I knew the students had to. And I did it well, but I, when the minute I got a chance to stop glazing, I stopped because I knew that it was, for me, it was just decoration, that what I had the hot for was form. So I turned decoration into form and used light to describe form. But that meant that inside, outside had, had its own interiority and exteriority and own light and own patterning and its own journey that if the pot is in time and you travel in, through, and around, and when you perceive it, you can't go around my pots 
without having a whole bunch of things that if you don't care about anything, it's going to just confuse the hell out of you. But if you care about it, you keep finding out stuff all the time that I'm ahead of you because I'm obsessed about it. So I, I'm, I know that's metaphoric to say, but they all connect together. But now, if you want to know what I'm doing now, I have a pot in the cellar. And I've made three of them. And the first two I was supposed to have for this show in Boston. One of them I overfired uh, for various health reasons because I'm getting glaucoma and I couldn't see inside. And the pot came out with all boils on it. Have you ever overfired something where the inside forms carbon? Ah, starts right. so bloats. Yeah, it was bloats. But it bloated beautifully. There were some places it looked like a pickle. And some place it looked like you had a tumor on your forehead. So I, I said, I'll, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to hit that with a hammer. I'm going to keep it. And I'm, now I'm thinking about, you know, could I make a texture on a pot that's pimples from bloating by just over-firing it a little bit? I'm not going to get to it in the time I have left, but, but it's a hot idea. But what I am doing is I started adding aggregates in, in the clay of my own Irish terrazzo, making hunks of fired clay loaded up with manganese and pieces of porcelain that are under-fired, about the same, putting them in a layer of clay and inlaying it and laying it laminates of slabs because I work with slabs over forms, styrofoam forms. And I got the styrofoam. That's another whole chapter in the confusion. My students rioted when the ID students got a shipload of styrofoam from Dow Chemical, and they were making the uh, Agent Orange, Orange in the Vietnam War. They threw all the styrofoam out the windows of the school onto Broad Street, and there were big blue shades of styrofoam floating down on the skies, hitting people and all the rest of it. The kids were furious. And I, afterward, I said, you know, you're, we're going to get thrown out of school and I'm going to get fired. So we went out and started picking it up. But afterward, I loaded my station wagon up. It looked like an escaped prisoner from a styrofoam factory in <laughs> Germany. <laughs> and I had, I started, instead of making plaster molds, I made styrofoam forms. And they were so light, you could flip them up and down and sideways. Now all my pots might start as igloos. Or like bowls, I could go like this, change the inside, change the outside, take the things out, put them back in. So it just made a whole new universe that happened with an accident, a serendipitous student revolt. So what I'm saying is the experiential aspect that art is experience is not a phony baloney smart guy's thing. And it's coming out of experience of our life. And he changed the whole perception of what art was in, in America. When I was learned, it was you were supposed to follow what your mentor did, become an expert, and if you had any brains at all, you'd transcend them and become an, a good artist. And if you had more brains than good artists, you'd tr become a genius. Bah, baloney. Every kid has a potential to be enormously creative about something. If the educational system would wise up and really nurture it, and it still is not doing it, and all these things like texting, is somebody, what you're doing, I'm not kidding you, that's why I like being here looking at you. Mm. You're doing something that's so obvious that nobody else has done yet because you found out while the wheel was spinning and the axis Monday inside. The very center of that axis is still. It is not moving. And it's the core that's making you wonder why it's spinning the way it is. And it's the core that's making you see a potential in experiential things that's coming into our life now. The, you, the kids now, if they weren't busy about killing people with buttons, turning their fingers into automatic things worse than pianos did, and made them use their fingers to feel that, that their fingers are nurturing their brains. What does it mean? Do you do tapping when you do yoga? Mm -mm. I do yoga every right. morning. 
Okay. Or walk if I walk. I, I only did a half hour this morning because I was walking to the train and back. Mm. And But I hitched a ride and got half of it. So I got... Well, this does something to your neural system. This does something to your lymph glands. Right. I'm nuts about trying to keep my machine going because mm-hmm. I know my brain is so weak. And it works. So it's all of a piece. So the guys that are hot and have passion want to have also disbelief. You get disbelief by knowing and learning more and more and wondering. So the big question is, what if? Not what. What is static? What is the center of the potter's wheel that does not turn? But it's the first thing, because most people think it's like the outside. They think it's spinning. But if you ask what, then you'd say, well, why is it not moving? So you just realize then it's a theoretical point around which things rotate, even though it's embedded in something that's solid and that really is. But there's a theoretical point where it don't turn or you don't have a cylinder. You can't have a rolling pin. Mm. You can't do this. You can't get an incline plan. Mm. You can't have the Pythagorean theorem. And so. So as an artist, what is your central point? Is it light? Like, are you interested in light? Are you interested no, in just No, my form? central point is when I get the feeling that I'm on to something that I don't know that I can share with someone else. So that process of discovery. A discovery and the exposition of it till it communicates. I can get off on just a turd with my thumb in it <laughs> and rubbing it under my armpits. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's not enough. Sure. If you want to be an artist... You, it, you have to share it to have that it, experience. It complete. has to be triadical. It has to be, it's, the, it's the material, it's the maker, and it's the perceiver. When it perceives to me, I go with it. Now, my big thing now, and you'll have to probably delete this, but my big thing now is at 89, I've, I've just about lost all my erotic capabilities as a body. But my mind's understanding about what eros, this, another big trichotomy that anybody that's learning about art needs to know, is familia. Do you know this? Mm-mm. But I know about eros, familia, and then... Agape. Okay. okay. That's a trinity. Right. Well, my eros capacity is, is less. My familiar thing, my son is going to eat with me. Big deal. Three kids, none are in jail. They're all working. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but my eros thing, I'm, I'm, my, my art also has ended up being a form of wondrous sublimation because so many of the guys that I was with died at 18 because they couldn't adapt. So I'm now making pots. I've been dealing with bumps and holes in my work, as you look from day one. And, uh, well, that sense puberty for sure. Mm, sure. <laughs> and, and so now I'm working on bladder forms. The first pots were the goat udders. Just leather, you hung them up, and they were hollows, and you put a string in them, and they'd hold milk like the goat did. So I made a lot of forms that were... I discovered the vesica, two circles intersecting, Mm. the yin-yang, Christian yin-yang, and so on. So this all filled in. But now I'm making bladder forms that are directional, like a catamaran, okay? Mm. That means the pot stands up, and it's off the ground while it's standing up without legs, because its form makes it stand up. But the, the inside and the outside... The inside is a cosmic crouch. It's like all the tunnels the trains go through that, this, that, that the guys years ago believed that subconscious things could be thought about and transposed into images that communicated deeply to other human beings. So I'm not trying to make swarmy pots. I'm not trying to make porno ceramics. Mm. If I was, I'd be rich fast. <laughs> no, no. But I'm trying to make a form now that'll hold the pot up 
but be an engaging thing going through it when you look there. And when I was a, when I, after the war, I had a rowboat. When I was a little boy, I had a sailboat with a paper boy, and we sailed up and down the Hudson River. But afterward, we went rowed over there all the time as veterans, and rowed through all of the Liberty ships that were stored in the Hudson River at Nyack. And when you rowed through there, you were in a big space, and as you rowed, you'd get it's so close. The hull was coming down like this. You get so close at the bottom, in the middle, that you could touch both sides with your oars. Yeah. And, and when some of the boats were smaller, you could touch them with your arms. Yeah. Or you could lean over if your buddy held you and touch them. So, in, in other words, that's a tactile. The deepest sense is smell. One smell and you can have a whole experience completely. Colors, who you were with, what you were doing, all of it. The next thing is touch, and touch is the province of all things that make people with materials. So anything that engenders this into your neural system, your fingers, is gonna be and your touch. whole sense of body, uh, tapping your head, you know, maybe that's like if I get making the bumps, maybe I'm making bumps on the inside, but uh, that's the what if, okay? Mm -hmm. So I think it's all one continuum. So when you're looking at these forms, you talked about this form that comes up from like a catamaran That's right. bottom that co comes I'm up to that. I'm putting two of them together. It's like two, two saddlebags that went over a horse. Ah, right. The reason they had it, it went over the horse's back so the guy could sit on the top of it. Mm. So functionality and expressiveness, anything that isn't functional about what it's intending to be is not art. And so anything that's, oh, this is expressive, is missing something at the essential core unless it misses, meets a different thing. You know the bean of Inish Kapoor out in Chicago mm -hmm. in the park? Mm -hmm. It's the greatest piece of sculpture since the pyramids. Because of people's relation to it physically Every, and how that affects everything. their mind? He, he accounted for everything. Technology, new technology. A great form that's totally ambiguous. It's a big bean. It's, it's not a torus. It's not a sphere. It's not a cone. It's just a big, I don't know. And inside it, it has a, 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 a cosmic cone going up. So when you get under it, you look up, you're looking into the maw, like lip, looking into a well, like looking into a big pot. That's where I was when I looked the sidewalk is graphed off in squares, and they're all f reflected in the parabolic form that Inish Kapoor made. And so are the people. So when they go up to it, they can look up and they can see themselves foreshortened. They can see themselves in the grid. And if they move around, they see themselves being distorted on the parabola. So it's both uh, one of those funny mirrors in the playground. So experientially, it's so rich that every guy that goes that's on a Sunday morning, instead of going to church, he takes his kid to the museum and they go through the park. Everybody in the family is dazzled beyond knowing by an experience. And in the meantime, when you get away from it, you see the whole skyline of Chicago bent around this thing and stretched like this. So, you know, that's magnificent art for me. Now, my parts are like, you know, hula hoop is to football. But if you touch my parts and you wish to be patient with them and you look at the colors and what the fire did to it and what I did to it and what the clay did to it that didn't, I didn't want it to do, how it shrunk or how it warped or how it did this or how it did that. If I get that all together, then I know I'm on it. And it doesn't happen all the time. But if I don't get it and I care about it, I keep my mind always sees something. When I couldn't get a big, great big pot that was a weird shape to stay where it was, I started beefing up the limbs. And some of them I learned from throwing. You know how you flop the top over and you smooth it out? Mm. Well, you can do that when you're hand building, too. 
but you can do it better because you can make this thing go from that to this just by your rib hand doing it. So all I'm saying, all the skills you learn about how you solve this from not happening or that from not happening, tell you, I, I started fooling around with textures. I had a meat tenderizer. I had a big fat edge, and it was dead as hell. I started smacking it with the meat tenderizer, and it started looking like bicycle threads, like I miniaturized automobiles that rode around this form. And whether you knew it or not, when you, with your mind, you danced or you rode on that road that I made, you were, well, it's not a big deal, but, but it's at the core of what it's about. So I'm still doing that. So let's talk about working from the subconscious, because it seems like that you're improvising in some ways, but your forms often reference architecture, which is not improvised. I know all of it. My son is an architect. I learned architecture because he studied at Temple and was on the third floor, and I watched architects being learned. I taught industrial designers who solve problems every day about would this goop sit inside this can or not and how big it should have to be or what it's about. So it's not just architecture. The geometry of structures is whether it's containing or holding up. You make a pot yourself. If you don't have the right thickness between the bottom and the top, you end up having a pot that turns into a cow flop. That's awareness of material and structure and time. So it's not as simple as saying architecture. Right. If you just copy architecture, you never make an Inish Kapoor. Now, Tom over there, see that? Mm -hmm. that, that model? Mm -hmm. Tom made that model. That's based on the form of my pots for an exposition we did in Korea. He went as an architect and I went as a mud guy. So nobody will build that, but if they had any brains, they would. But that's not a pot that comes off Louis Kahn, which is his mentor. I don't know if that makes sense. It does make sense. Because yeah. when I think about yours as geometry, but also that there's some role of the subconscious involved in that geometry, like you talked about the... You were I interacting with the meat tenderizer on the clay, and then in your head you thought bicycle, but then that changed the form once no, you didn't. thought. I didn't think bicycle. I hit it. I name stuff after it's finished. So it's all intuitive in the process. No, of it's that. not. Okay. Because I know that the clay won't work if I do it the wrong way. Mm. I know that it's a lousy form if it stands up, but that it's dorky. That's what I call or <laughs> ugliness. So it's a synthesis of many, many things. And one of them is that they're intellectually rigorous. If you do the same thing over and over, you're a dork. If you do it once too many times, I just made a pot about four months ago with Tom. Tom came and gave me a quit, and he's very nice, but he's my son, and usually he's very kind to me. And he said, Dad... You can't do the same thing and put all your good moves in one pot. I said, what are you saying? It was like he stuck a dagger in my ears. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, these are all moves that you used, and you've used too many of them. And, you've, and especially when they, and then afterwards he said to, to pull the thing out and have the blood start squirting, he said, especially when they don't work. Mm. Okay, so that's architectural. That's problem solving. Mm. So I, together, I had a big carving knife that I put a tape handle on because the handle broke and my wife gave it to me to put in the shop. So I cut it. We cut 80 pounds of unnecessary things. It changed from a vesica mm. into a chiclet. It just totally transformed the pot by removing what didn't work. Now that's not just intuition. That's acting on judgment after the fact. And then and the fact of work processing that you get so you have a real intuition. There's a great book by a guy named Benedetto Croce called Intuition. And he calls intuition the highest kind of knowing, the highest kind of knowledge. It's when you transform into information into empathic knowing. That's a different can of worms. And you don't get it without a kind of inner 
uh, sensitivity to the nature of the multiple things that you're varying at the same time so you don't have to think about it. If you ever saw a guy that can't write anymore trying to relearn how to write, you'd realize that when you write your initial, how many different separate things you need to get control of. So all these variables working in your life now, I would imagine in the process of making and firing that you need other people to help you because you're making yes. really, really big, big things. Big deal. Yeah. So well, how does that change your work when you're getting people to Not help? at all. Okay. So it's still all original thought in your no, head. No, no. It's not original. Uh, uh, and on one level, it's all original because this, this guy, Purse, that I mentioned, made a holy trinity, a trichotomy of how people think. And he said, thought is a kind of action, whether you act on it or not. The wheels are turning, impulse is there. So, if that's so, then we think so we can believe. Go to if. He didn't say that, I said that. If you go to if, you have how and why and many things. You go to if so that you can trust it, that it works. When it works, you have belief. I'm talking about this is thought I'm saying, sure. describing. All in the mind. When you have belief, you can practice. You believe in yourself, your work, your tools, your education, your parents, your food, your toilet practice. Big thing when you get to be 90. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not lineal. And he calls that firstness, secondness, and thirdness. Those three. So thought, belief, and what's the third? Well, the first one is, is uh, oh, now I can't even say it over again straight. That's how bad I am. Uh, you, you, if you go, I do it backwards. As an artist, I practice so I can have belief. I have belief so that I can trust. And I have trust because I... I make that first move. Hmm. So so this, that first move is thought. And the next three are up to me about what thought is. So I'm much better at that way than going from thought up, up the other way. And so when I have to say it straight, I can only say it backwards. <laughs> and I found out in my own thinking, every time I screw up, if I think about from where I screwed up and went back, I know where I missed the trolley. If I sit around hindsight. and fud myself about what I, how stupid I am, I don't get there. So as you've become an artist, or, or your career is really long. Like you've been a maker for yeah, in 60 terms of, years, 70. I, the, I just had a pot 14 for 7. The, the book is, is a book full of six, six, 60 years worth of crap. <laughs> and I left, I left a lot of it out because we only started... With, with when I was in art school, and there's none of my kid stuff there, <laughs> which is really the real juice. I wish I had one of those paintings that was done with beet juice. And, and so, what do you think when you look back at those early pots now? Because this book, you've it, the great thing about a book is that it is linear. Yeah, exactly. You can look at those really early right. works and you can see the end. So, what do you think now about sixty years ago? I the think work you they're were making? they're about the same thing. They've just evolved. They're much more complex. They're much more convoluted. They demand more esoteria to gain entry. Uh, they're much less immediate and fast. I think too much in the process. I ponder. I, I make mistakes now that I never would have made. I can't even make a thing that has the same cross-section that it had 20 years ago. So I can't make the same forms. But I can adapt to all of it, and I can make pots that in my old days I would say, oh, that's no good, it's too heavy. Now it just has to be heavy that way or the rest of it can't exist. And I say, okay, darling, nobody will pick it up. Yeah, and, and, and it's very interesting to, to think about your thoughts advancing, even though the physicality of it at this point might be going back a little well, bit. That's the biggest thing about my pots now. They take longer. They tend to be less successful easily. 
I seem to have duller signals about what's wrong right away, but I get it anyway. If I keep my energy up and cut down on my nap time and so on, I can still make it happen. So I know that the part I have now, I'm trying something that I haven't done yet, and I have the hearts to do it. I've just spent so much time on my career with book promotion and all this other crap, shows and all this stuff, that I'm not getting the studio time in. So my next move after I finish this, I have to go to Alfred and then I'm done. When I get that done, I just have to stay in the studio. Before, I couldn't stay in the studio because I had a family. I had to go to get groceries. We had the kids with earaches and and I had a beautiful wife that I had the hots for and all the rest of it and all this multiplicity of trying to stay alive like you are right now. And now you have these big spaces that you don't have to fill with anything. But I still have a kind of fire in my gut, and all my main job is to keep it burning. And I could stop making pots tomorrow. I just made a really, I'll send you one if you give me a address. I made a weird, weird thank you note for the people that helped me so much in Boston. It was just like, you know, coming home again 50 years later. It was just like a corny novel or a 1930s movie with a cowboy in it. And I made a big me called, I changed my name to New Me. That's the new me, N-E-W-M-E dash, but I'm, I'm just spelling it N-U-M-E. So I hope when I go back to this pot now that's all wrapped up and I'm going to work on it this week, hopefully. I wasn't supposed to come talk to you. Uh, uh, Well, I appreciate that you did. No, no, that's (laughs) not that. But I just want to say that new me, if I haven't really knew me, I'll be, uh, it won't be this big head coming over. I have all strings like I'm a puppet coming down. It's the crappiest art drawing that any human beings ever made. And I sent it everybody for thank yous. And I'm sure they're going to say, Daly's finally slipped. <laughs> He's crazy. But it's the nuts. And uh, I hope I can just keep that, but turn it not into caprice. That drawing was caprice about something that wasn't important anyway. It took more time sending them out and addressing them and, all, and color. I love the coloring now. I, I spent days, which had nothing. It made it worse and worse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so all I'm saying is that if I can now transfer Numi into the pot that was, was a new was that hasn't really happened yet, mm-hmm. and what I have to do to it to make it get alive more than because I've started making cisterns. Cisterns are the only pot that people haven't done again since the Etruscans, because they don't need the whole water. It's in their pipes. But all, all the great Etruscan pots, all the great Korean pots are either made to hold food up in the air because they didn't have any tables, two pieces, stands, and things, or their cisterns, or their big pots to hold kimchi and bury in the ground so they don't starve that winter. So it's youth, function, structure, inner core, new form in that matrix. So a cistern has me turned on now. And I'm grinding these big flanges, you'll see them in the book, with my Irish terrazzo with diamond pads, 25 bucks a pad. I had 25 bucks extra 50 years ago. I'd have to go buy some groceries extra. We'd buy olives. But it's gorgeous because when you touch it, it's like a baby's cheek. But when you rub your hand on the bicycle treads, you get an electric current just like a thermocouple. If you touch them like this, You can feel it going up your arm. I can. And if other people can't, that's their problem. But I know it. And the pots are hot. So is your your aging, your physical body is aging, but you have a very childlike presence. Like when I'm talking to you, you're so interested in possibility. You're interested in Numi as you described. 
So you're looking forward. A lot of people at your age are looking backwards. Well, I better look forward because in my prison camp experiences, we don't want to go back to that. I found many people who were 18, guys that were 22, who lost the capacity to live in the present by taking whatever there was and doing something, didn't make it. So I must admit that my intensity is increasing, that when I taught students, I had to be very careful that I didn't scare them the first half of the semester. And I had to be careful that I didn't ream them out until the very end before they'd have enough guts to go home and rest and decide that I was right. So what I'm saying is that I have excessive exuberance. I've had it since I was a little kid. I kept always losing everything because when I put it down, I didn't care about it and I couldn't find it. It meant I lost it. My father would have to get me another one or we wouldn't have one. When I was in art school, I bought a new overcoat for $12. I lost it in two days and didn't have any coat for the winter. But I was so used to it from freezing in Germany that it didn't even bother me. I was eating so well that I had enough fat on me, I guess, that it didn't matter. So all I'm saying is that now, my, if I'm, I'm going after this interview to the VA to get some medicine, but the shrink at the VA said to me, you have to learn to step back, but to learn to step back for me is to step into a big hole, a black hole. You go down a chute and come out the other end and you're in the garbage. For me, it's not stepping out at back, it's stepping ahead no matter what. So I've, But I've had that always, that when the smart kids were smart, I found out, you know, all, most of the artist people that were way better than I was, they just stop sooner, you know. And I think I still have a chance to get it really right, better. If I can just stay all of a piece, I can do it. And I think I will. I, my big worry about my exuberance, I, I hope I can keep it. But it, it can also become a form of infantilism. And so I, that's one of my big worries. I get so excited about something that I don't track it properly. So I'd like to know how much of the hour have we used up by my constant babbling. You know, we are almost to an hour, but I, I think what you're talking about here is so much the nature of you as a person that you're always looking forward. So I think this is perfect. So you think we should quit right now? I think this is a, a good place to oh, stop. Oh, that suppresses me. We didn't talk about any of the real good stuff. Well, well let's talk about the good stuff then. And maybe can you talk about what you would offer someone of my generation? Because you have 60 years of making. Yes, I can. I think that your generation is trapped in a, a whole bunch of real parameters that I can give you no advice about, but I can recognize it, I can feel it, I can see what you're subject to. We talked a little bit about just business practice. Mm -hmm. But... What's happening in this country is a kind of spirit line. And the spirit line's out of balance. If you think of it like a seesaw, economically and socially, the people on, that have all of it are out on the end of the seesaw. And the great majority, this majority, is this much on the back of the seesaw. And the seesaw is like this. It's not balanced at all. And as an artist, and wishing to be an artist, and really make the real spirit line have spirit, it means that the balance has to be enough. It can be like this. When I was a boy, I deeply believed, and my father believed, that if we did what we had to do, if we didn't steal anything, if we all loved each other, if my kids that my mother took in were my brothers, we shared what we had, we lived together. The whole thing was a different world. And we were way down on the back, supposedly, but we all knew that it was an, there was a kind of upward mobility. Most of the people that are this side now know that it's hopeless. The odds which you're trying to do is whether you're going to join the system or go against the system. 
whether you're going to venture and take risks and pay the price. I didn't have any choice. I got captured. I got shot down out of a bomber. I bailed out. I only made one mission, but it was quite serious. I went to prison camp. I walked 350 miles in the middle of the winter down the coast of the German Sea there, the Baltic. Anyway, uh, so I had a a whole series of absolutely horrendous experiences. I washed out of the cadets. It meant that I was a teenage failure. You know, I thought there's nothing left in life now. I'm not going to fly an airplane. I'm a failure and all that crap. I got to the point where I was, you know, that breathing was got to be a real important thing. Chi is first, way before smell or touch. No chi, no touch, no smell. So if you try to figure out what you're doing, which is really neat, but if you f- can use that to do what you want to do, I love teaching. I s- decided that I wanted to be a teacher because it was the only thing in the school that I was going to where the, all the chances were being taken. Otherwise, I would go in to an academy and some guy would tell me everything I need to know and when I learned it from him, I'd be there. And I just didn't buy it. So now we, you have the privilege of that. But I had to go against it. But there was no the thing that happened. We were all veterans and if we, if we left the school, the school would close. But we were all so a psycho from experience. We had an epiphany early. And and in some ways, there are no epiphanies now. There are no clear goals now. So making one for yourself that's risky enough and deciding what you really want to do, really, really want to do, and do it. So if mud's your life, you, you have a transformational material. The stuff's magic. It goes from dust to mud to stone and back. The shale in my clay is, my, my, my low fire clay is shale that's scraped off or turned into rock already and we got it back there. So, and, but the technologies now that are, can be used, they're all being used for commodification. 99% of ceramics, when I decided to be a mud man, it seemed to me that it was much better than painting. I started out wanting to be a painter. I did clay in high school, but I, it didn't whack me. But when I got in art school and I had this teacher that nearly turned me on my ear, and all the other veterans as well, five kids out of the class turned into mud people. One of them won the Syracuse Club five years after he graduated. We'd been in the Marine Corps. So anyway... We kind of knew what we were about. I quit two jobs. I could have taught at General Motors and been a car designer. (laughs) All right? I could have been an administrator and been a dean. I could have gotten more pay by being promoted to do something I didn't want to do because it was better. You made more. You could eat more. You could buy better clothes for your kids and all this crap. Not crap, but real life stuff. So that's my advice. Do everything you have to do. I had, I on my Christmas card last year, I said, love and joy. Big things. Don't muck with them. Health. And the other thing is what? Usually. Can you tell me? Wealth. Right? That's that's health and wealth. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Da-da-da. Upward. You know what it is? It's health and stealth. Stealth, is, it, it, to me, is empathic, earned wisdom called to intuition that gives you prescience about whether you are where you are spiritually that lets you know that even if you screw up, you'll be better off than if you do what you don't believe in or want to do. And if you want to do that badly enough, then use your stealth and don't, I'm not saying, it's not about breaking the wall, the wall of law at all. It's about doing things that have what you're doing now. Now, you don't know the end of where you're going, and I could tell you all kinds of things of how to use stealth to make that work. 
without violating anything that you believe in. And that's where the balance wheel ought to be for all of us. But it's not now. We're being massively betrayed by the people who are in the system and made it work for them. And most of them that's supposed to be our helpers through our democratic system are already co-opted. So if you're part of that mon revolutionary minority that's going to make spirit, culture, I'm not talking about religion, although religion's right in the middle of it. Mm. Deep belief gained by being a human being through practice. If you want to be about that, you're, in there, you're off to, I'd give you a 976 start. I'm not making that up either. Now that, that might sound like enormously elliptical. Somebody, if they listen to this and don't understand you and I here together now, they'll sing, that guy's dotty. And I'm totally surfaced that there's Thomas back. If he's not ready, he's going to come in and say, Dad, you had it. We're going to eat. <laughs> Well, I, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. I don't it. know if that's the kind of advice. That isn't really what you were, you were thinking, really, of limited professional advice. No, I was thinking of exactly what you're saying, which okay. is, is that there's a, a mix between passion, intelligence, and action. That's and, right. Well, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to do this. I appreciate All right. it. That's it. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.